teacher, please, we're going to go ahead and get started. There's a few people I need to recognize before our guest speaker comes. Let me say a little bit about the state of Alabama. They're so far ahead of other states for, on their medical advisory issues. We have a great medical advisory board in this state. We're so proud to have our member of our medical advisory board with us. Some of them are on the front row, gentlemen, if you'll stand. Robinson co-chairs our, stand up gentlemen, let's recognize our medical advisory board. Thank you gentlemen. Now on behalf of the Alabama High School Athletic Association, it is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for our medical advisory session. He is the team doctor for the University of Alabama. The UA Medical Sports Medical Center in Alabama has been named in his honor. And we won't hold this one against him. He is a graduate of Louisiana State Medicine in 1985, but we won't hold that against him since we have a crystal ball. We'll, we'll let that one go. He is co-chairman of the AHSAA Medical Advisory Committee. Helped about, he designed our pre-physical form for us and does our updates. And he does a tremendous job for the student athletes in the state of Alabama. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Robinson. Dr. Robinson. Can you all hear me? This is Mike. I'd like to thank the uh, Athletic Association for inviting me to come back and talk to you all. I'm not going to talk about concussion, I promise. If everybody in this room doesn't know how to take care of a concussion as well as I do, we've not done our job. So I know it's been kind of in your head. But one of the things I do want to talk about, especially now that we're seeing these hotter days, blame it on global warming or whatever thing you want to blame it on, but it is getting hot and we're not haven't even gotten to our hottest month yet. But we're going to start having some problems with heat illness, but not in this state. Because you're all going to go back and make sure that we don't have this problem because it's completely preventable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, go through it. Unfortunately, just like anything else, I've got to give a little background science, but most of the stuff that I want to do is stuff that I hope that you all can take back to your schools to implement, to be able to try to prevent this, to keep your kids healthy, some tricks and these kind of things. So uh, bear with me through the, through the uh, medical stuff. Talk a little bit about the physiology of heat illness and then all the different types of heat illness. And then for you all, it's going to be mostly treatment and prevention. He knows this is a major concern for our athletes, right? especially in this hot and humid condition that we have down here. It's so much different than other parts of the country. And you have a lot of kids that miss practice and games because of heat illness. There have been 29 deaths in high school sports in the last 10 years related to heat stroke, but 18 deaths in the last five years. We're seeing a rise in this for a lot of different reasons, but this is a thing that's concerning to me. It's the third most common cause of death of your athletes. Okay? And it usually occurs in the first four days of practice, which are coming up in a couple of weeks, and hopefully we're going to try to prevent that. The most important thing is death from heat, from exertional heat stroke is completely preventable. We, should, we, we don't want to have any, and we're not going to have any deaths in this state from heat stroke due to your diligence. All right, here comes the basic science. Basically, your body's temperature is controlled by the brain. It's a complex, complex interaction with various sensors throughout the, the, the body where the, uh, blood vessels dilate, the blood is shunted into the skin to help evaporate. Now, when you sweat, evaporate, try to cool yourself down. Uh, if there's an interruption of this anywhere along the pathway, then your risk for heat stroke goes up tremendously. One important thing is that if, without any kind of way of losing heat, your body temperature goes up almost every two, goes up two degrees every five to ten minutes of exercise. That's tremendous. It doesn't take long to get your core temperature up to a dangerous level. Some important things on, on heat transfer, how do we gain or lose heat? One of the most important things is conduction. That's where it transfers heat from a warm object to a cooler object. Water cools 25 times faster than the air. When we talk about how to prevent or treat illness, we're going to talk about how to take care of these. But if you put an athlete in cold water, they're going to cool down 25 times faster than if you just try to cool them in the shade. Convection is the heat from one object to, to the surrounding air. Um, if you have wind blowing or fans blowing, the 
and that increases your transfer of heat about five times. Okay, another very fast way to cool them down. And then if the temperature is greater than 96 degrees, which it will be at 8 o'clock in the morning some days in August, then any kind of heat from the sun is going to be a heat gain. The athletes not going to be able to lose their heat. Evaporation is the only way that we can actually exchange heat in the summer months or get rid of to cool our bodies down. Okay? It's dependent on the humidity, the velocity of the air, how fast it's moving, how much area their skin is exposed, and the sweat rate of, of the various athletes. When the humidity is above 60%, and I can't remember the last time I've seen humidity below 60% in this state, then the, the, the evaporation is not very effective. We've all experienced that going outside after taking a shower, all of a sudden you're just as wet as you were when you stepped out. Okay? Um, it decreases your total body water, which decreases with hydration, and you can get decreased blood flow, uh, so you can get decreased sweat production, so you have less heat evaporation going on, so which is a, Again, going to make them hot. Clothing and equipment reduces surface area. Okay, so if you only have your arms exposed when you have full pads on, then you're going to have less area for heat exchange. Children exchange most of their heat through their head. But what do we do with that? We put a helmet on. Okay, a nice a hard plastic helmet that there's no heat exchange from. So they have a very difficult time losing um, their heat. So the football uniform reduces their surface area by over 60%. And, and, and reduce the surface area and the evaporation rate by 60%. An athlete coming in that's not very, uh, in, in very good shape will sweat about a liter an hour. Okay? It sounds like a lot, but it's not much. A well acclimated athlete can sweat up to uh, uh, one and a half liters an hour. Okay? The problem with that is, is they can get dehydrated a lot faster and as their sweat rate increases, they're losing a lot of electrolytes like sodium is the most important one, so they're at risk for heat cramps and some other illnesses. One of the things that I've seen more of a problem with is medications. So many children in our high schools and, and, and even junior high schools are taking med certain medications that can increase their risk for heat stroke. Most of the medications for attention deficit disorder increase their risk for heat stroke. So that's really important. We try to keep a list of the kids that are on these medications to try to make sure that they're not having a problem. And I would bet you that on, on a team of 100 athletes, um, you probably have at least 20 to 20 or so of those athletes are on these stimulant medications. Uh, there's some other medications. A lot of these kids put a lot of ointments and stuff on their skin, which decreases their sweat rate, rate also. Brief thing on this type of different uh, heat illnesses that we have. Um, we've got heat cramps I want to mention a little bit about. Heat syncope or collapse, heat exhaustion. Mostly on heat stroke that I want to talk about, and a little bit on exertional rhabdomyolysis and why we do the sickle cell testing. So heat cramps, we're all familiar with this, right? They get these painful cramps. It's usually in the early parts of the year. Um, I, I don't think I've ever been to a Friday night football game in, in September, even up to October, where some athlete on one of the teams didn't go down with heat cramps. Uh, we see it in practices, etc. We know that it's, it's related to the amount of food, so they're a little bit dehydrated. More importantly to me, it's, it's related a little bit to the amount of sodium that's in their body, how much salt they're taking in. Uh, there are a lot of different things. Some kids are more high strung and anxious. Uh, those kids tend to, to hyperventilate a little bit, and that can lead to cramping. Um, when you have somebody that's cramping or has a lot of problems with cramping, right when it happens, obviously you're gonna take them off the field or, or take them out of practice. Try to give them fluids, it's going to take hours before that fluid replacement takes place, okay? We try to give them salt, but by then, by the time they're cramping, it's not going to help at all. You can stretch them, massage them. Some places at, at, at college level, at professional level, we give IV fluids to try to stop it. There's all kinds of medications that people have tried, none of which really work very well. Now, even I, I'm not as old as most of the people in this room uh, looking around, certainly not as old as Coach Savarese. Um, but uh, even I took salt tablets when I played high school football. We went through a period of time when water was bad, and everybody was giving salt tablets. Then we said salt's bad and water's good. We gave everybody water, and y'all do a fantastic job of hydrating athletes. But then we weren't giving much sodium, uh, sodium chloride, and so then we had more of a problem with heat cramps. Um, 
Don't be afraid to advise taking extra salt or have your athletes take extra salt, whether it's in the form of salt tablets, pretzels, popcorn, sunflower seeds, potato chips, or if there's nutritional seeds here, I'm sorry. But any of those forms of getting salt into their system. One of the things you hear about, oh, if you take too much salt, your blood pressure is going to run up and all these kind of things. It does not affect a young athlete's blood pressure at all. So don't be afraid to encourage your athletes to really salt up, especially your cramps. Some athletes pour out three liters in a couple hours practice. You can weigh them before and after. They're losing six pounds to ten pounds. I've had some athletes lose up to 15 pounds in a single practice, and they lose a ton of salt. Up to 14 grams of sodium is lost in the sweat with these. A bad American diet, okay, so if you're eating McDonald's or you're going out every night, a bad American diet is about 7 grams of salt. So if you're losing 14 every day and you eat terribly, you're still halfway behind. Okay, so encourage your athletes to take extra salt, especially your cramps. The ones that cramp despite taking salt, we really have to work with. We've got a couple of athletes in Alabama that I make them sleep with a salt pick. Um, just put a, put, a, put a wig on it, make them think it's their girlfriend or something. But it's the only way to get salt in some of these guys is enough to, to, to keep them from cramping. Heat syncope is basically just that feeling of lightheadedness business. Anybody in here that's cut their grass on a hot day, by the time you're finished, you have it. You're about to ready to just collapse. Okay? Um, again, first occurs in the first couple of days. Uh, and that's mainly because your body hasn't adjusted to, to the heat and you can't expand your blood volume very quickly. Kind of real simple season. These are all kind of in a continuum. Heat syncope that goes on to heat exhaustion that goes on to heat stroke. So some of the symptoms you'll see overlap each other. But basically you get that, that you can collapse if you had it, but that dizziness. We've all had that feeling where our vision kind of came in on us and everything like that. Feel like we're about to go out. Uh, pulse rate may slow down. But your temperature is normal. You haven't increased your core temperature. Again, it's a dehydration phenomenon. You have these, these, if you have it personally, you have athletes have it, you want to get them to a, to a shaded area. Um, you sometimes lift their legs up to get the blood going to the brain instead of down to their toes. Uh, and then try to rehydrate them before take them out. Heat exhaustion is usually a, a worsening of heat syncope. So we're to the point where they can't continue to go on. So they get to the point where they just have so much muscle weakness and everything from being so exhausted, from uh, being so dehydrated that they can't continue. Everybody in this room that takes care of us and the athlete that practices or plays outdoors, whether it's football or soccer or whatever, has seen kids that have gotten this hot uh, for one reason or the other. Um, a lot of different reasons for it. All of these signs, symptoms, again, a lot of, but most of the time it's basically the fainting and the collapsing on the field. Um, sweating tremendously, uh, they may have a lot of other different conditions and things. The treatment again, get them into a cool area. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on for you, for how you do it. Measure the rectal temp. Now nobody in this room is going to measure the rectal temp of their athletes. But the athletic trainer that's working with you hopefully will. And hopefully, one, and I know everybody, everybody has these, before I leave this planet, God forbid, State of Alabama is going to have athletic trainers at every high school. I'm happy to fix that. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> but basically, bottom line is you just got to cool these athletes down. If they have a, if you have an athletic trainer and they do, they're doing their temperature, as long as their temperature is not above 104 degrees, they're going to do fine. There's a lot of ways to cool these athletes down. Sometimes they end up having to go to the emergency room and get IV fluids. Usually, they, we keep them out of practice for a, a day or so to let them rehydrate their body so they don't uh, get problems with their kidneys. The main thing I wanted to talk about was heat stroke. Okay? By definition, the, the core temperature is greater than 104 degrees. Now everybody, at some point in time in their life, had a fever from the flu, strep throat, pneumonia, whatever it is. Your temperature probably did not get up to 104 degrees. Now, um, small infants, anybody that's had small children, sometimes their temperature get up to 105 degrees. I get that panic phone call all the time. My baby's brain's going to fry. What do I need to do? Because the temperature of the body doesn't get damaged until the temperatures are greater than 113 degrees. And if that happens, the house is on fire. So you don't usually see it. But the long-term comes the other problems that happen to the kidneys and other vital organs can it happen once the temperature gets to greater than 104 degrees. It stays that way. Okay? 
um, usually it's a complete total body collapse when this happens and it is life threatening at a very high mortality rate. Okay? The, the mortality rate is directly related to how long it takes you to cool these athletes down. Okay? So if you have an athlete that collapses out in the hot sun, the one thing I want you to take away from this is if I do nothing else, wherever he goes, he's going to be cold. You're not going to want them going anywhere when they're still hot. So you're going to try to cool them down as fast as possible. A lot of different risk factors for heat stroke, prior heat stroke. Um, an overweight athlete, we're seeing a bunch of problems with that. As you know, we're having an obesity epidemic in this country, and certainly in the South. Um, lack of acclimatization. Some of these athletes may have been working indoors all summer and then show up on the first day of practice um, and have not been in the heat whatsoever. Or if they're doing some workouts on their own, just like I would, you're going to exercise at 5 in the morning or 9 o'clock at night so you don't have to exercise in the heat. But that's not going to get your body ready for this. Again, the drugs that I worry about, both legal and illegal, that we have to deal with in our today's society. One of the things that we have to be cautious of is some of these children get sick, sometimes in the, with summer colds at the end of summer stuff, and if, they, if an athlete has a fever, anytime when it's hot, I would just make a general rule that they don't practice. Their risk for heat stroke with a fever due to an illness is tremendous. No matter what you do, even if you have a light, you know, walkthrough type practice um, with shorts and, and nothing in helmets, their risk for heat stroke just because they have a, a, an infection going on is tremendous. That ought to be kind of a rule. Hopefully that's a no-brainer. Hopefully the parents are taking care of that for you. Some of the things that, that happen that we can take care of, though, uh, are different things that you all are in control of, whether it's the intensity and duration of the activity, whether there's access to shade and water, um, if there's a difference, a marked ratio difference between how hard they're working and how and the breaks that they're getting. Okay? Uh, inappropriate clothing, anybody that wears sweat, some of these sweat suits, these, these rubber suits that we all have seen our, uh, our, our athletes that have to make weight wear, tremendously increase their risk for heat stroke. Okay? Lack of education on exertional heat stroke, we're getting rid of that one today. And then the delay in treatment, again, that's the one thing that I want to, we're going to emphasize. Most important sign and symptom for, for us as medical personnel is their poor temperature. Okay, so our temperature greater than 104 rectal, we'll talk about a little bit of how we're going to measure that later on. Usually they have a real fast heart rate, they're, they're, they're usually delirious. Okay, so they're usually incoherent. They can't talk to you, they may be completely unconscious. Um, there's a difference between exertional heat stroke and classic heat stroke. Whenever you listen to the news or read a newspaper, you'll see when the heat wave hits the Midwest or the Northeast, that people are dying left and right of heat stroke. Most of the time, those are elderly people who are on numerous medications. They'll give you classic signs that, that those people never sweat or anything like that. They're dry. Athletes are going to be sweating when they have a heat stroke, I guarantee you. Um, they may be sick, they may even have a seizure. Most of the time, again, they go into a coma. Um, and again, the mortality rate is up to 80%, depending on when you take care of it. Now, the treatment is to measure rectal temperatures. And again, nobody in this room, other than the athletic trainer myself, is going to be doing that. But it's the one thing that we know will save lives. So if your school is presented with a heat policy by your team physician or an athletic trainer, if you have it, Understand why that this is one of those things. We all worry about it, embarrassing our children or put them in, in situations that are uncomfortable for everybody involved, and obviously this would be one of them. But it would be no different of me cutting off the jersey of a girl who's a basketball player if she had a heart attack on, us, on the uh, court and I want to put a shocking and AED on her. Okay? While I've got to make sure that I try to protect her by its modesty, there are certain things that are considered life saving emergency techniques, and this is one of them. Again, it's not one that's nice to talk about. Lower the temperature as rapidly as possible. There's a lot of ways to do that. Probably the best way, the way that I'm going to recommend that you all take care of heat stroke and heat illness in your schools is to drop them down into a bucket of ice water. Um, most of the athletic trainers, if you have a sports medicine program that takes you to school, they bought these 150 gallon Rubbermaid tubs that we fill up with ice water and have over next to the field house or wherever it is. So that if an athlete goes down, the first thing we do is drop them in that tub. Okay? When that happens, there's been no incidents of fatalities if they're cool 
come down in that first 10 minutes. That's huge. We had a triathlon in, in, in Tuscaloosa two years ago. It happened to be the hottest day of, of, in the history of Tuscaloosa for that particular April day. We had eight heat strokes come into our medical tent. All eight of them walked out and went home on their own. Not a single one went to the emergency room. The reason we did that is because we cooled them off immediately. Not everybody has got one of these cold tubs. So how else are you going to be able to cool them down? Probably the next best way to cool your athletes down is to get a, an ice chest full of water and ice and towels. Just keep it over on the side somewhere. If you have an athlete that goes down and you think that they may have a heat stroke, if you were just to take off their uniform and keep them modestly covered, lay these ice towels across their body from their head to their toes, and then change them out every couple of minutes, it's the second best way of cooling your athletes down. Once you start cooling them down, then you can go ahead and call 911. Now that's a little bit different departure from what you think about. Now I don't have a problem with anybody calling 911. But there was a, a guy who's an expert in heat on us, he gave a talk, and he said the number one cause of death from heat stroke was an ambulance. The delay in treatment from you calling the ambulance to the time they get them and take them to the hospital, wherever it is, I don't care if it's across the street, is at least going to be 30 minutes. Okay? And then, and then you are going to, these athletes, death rate increases rapidly. So this is how we do it. This is uh, 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 one of the cold tubs that I was talking about. This young lady, the athletic trainer, is holding a, a the, the probe, the, the actual readout from the rectal thermometer that's in the, the athlete right there. Somebody else is cooling down their head. Okay? So one of the most important things we say is transport first, I mean treat first, transport second. Okay? Call the ambulance after you get them cooled down. If you look at the survival rates, this is done on numerous studies, but if you look at the survival rate, within the first 30 minutes or so, your survival rate is pretty strong. Obviously, in the first 10 minutes, it's over 100, it's at 100%. But if you wait 30 minutes, or more than 30 minutes, your survival rate drops below 40%. And most of the time, especially if you're in a rural area, by the time you call the, the ambulance, they get there, they take them to the hospital, the doctor tries to figure out what's wrong with them, they're gone. Okay, we're going to prevent that. Get 100% survival rate if they're cooled within the first 10 minutes. Briefly on exertional randomizers, we all know that's why we do simple cell uh, testing uh, at the collegiate level. So you're hearing more and more about this. You'll have some athletes who will come up to you and say, I have sickle cell trait. Uh, basically, those athletes are at a higher risk for having a, a, a collapse uh, of their body system because their blood sickles due to sickle cell attachment half of the gene of sickle cell anemia. Usually it's, it's, it's very often confused with heat stroke and heat cramps. Now most of the time we've all experienced that Charlie horse where you, the, the muscle just balls up in your leg and you, and you can feel a hard knot where that muscle is. The pain that you get with from exertional red mouse is totally different. It's a severe pain just like it, but there's no contraction of the muscle. That's one of the ways I try to tell people to differentiate those two. Um, there's a lot of other causes for it, certain medications, both legal and illegal, and there's some various congenital metabolic disorders that we sometimes have to test our athletes for besides sickle cell, they can do it also. The most important thing is muscle pain, they just hurt. This is an athlete that looks like he's dogging it if you're doing conditioning drills. It usually happens in the very first part of, of, of practice, not at the end. These athletes come out and some coaches really work them, give them a real hard conditioning drill, run several sprints at the very beginning of practice to warm up. Some of these kids, this is when they collapse at the very beginning. But they, they, we think they're dogging it. The worst thing we do is get behind them and say, keep going, keep going, keep going. Their legs, their muscles will just not work because they're not getting blood flow there. Sometimes then, once they think that they're dogging it, they say, well, go in there and get cooled off. The athlete goes in there and he's either left unattended, goes in the bathroom a lot of times to urinate his is, is maple syrup colored or Coca-Cola colored. If any athlete ever reports that to you, you get them to a hospital as fast as possible. Okay, how you do that? Okay. Treatment, we take them out of activity. Um, at certain places, we administer oxygen. We have an actual protocol for this at the university where we, have, we will give them oxygen. We'll take their temperature first. Usually they don't have a high temperature at all. Take their temperature, make sure they don't have heat stroke. We give them oxygen, give them fluids, and then get them going. But the key is prevention. 
And again, that's the thing what I do is I used to always tell people before we used to have to have mandatory testing for sickle cell trait, I treated our athletes as if they all had it. So if they all, if I, if I made sure, if I treat them like they all had it, make sure they got hydrated, make sure we didn't overdo it, get overzealous at the very beginning of practice, recognize the signs and symptoms, then we were going to be okay. So this is for y'all, a little bit of prevention. One of the most important things that you should have is an emergency plan. And your schools are supposed to have an emergency action plan for the school. Well, you should have one for your athletic department also. And basically what it is is say, what happens if we have something bad happen? Where is the, we're going to call an ambulance. Who's going to call the ambulance? Where is the ambulance going to come in? Is that gate unlocked? Have we had construction recently and now the gate they used to come in is no longer there? How do we get them in? This plan should be reviewed every year by your coaching staff uh, and your athletic directors and make sure that everybody's on the same page. If you have an athletic trainer, you want to make sure that they're on the same page and everybody has reviewed this and practiced this. Where is our emergency facility? How are we going to get them there? How are we going to cool them down? Are we going to take their temperature or not? What are we going to do? Um, so, so having that emergency action plan before you did anything else is important and review it every year. All right. In the pre-participation physical, that's my job. One of the things that I do is I try to identify any child that may be at risk for heat stroke, whether they're taking medications that may do it, whether they have certain medical conditions that may cause problems, um, or whether they've had a heat illness before. And I try to really get on those kids that have had heat, heat problems before. Once you have a heat stroke, your body can no longer adjust its core temperature normally for the rest of your life. It's damaged permanently. So we have to be very careful with these athletes. You try to make sure that they've had adequate acclimatization to the heat. In general, that takes about 10 to 14 days. That's hard to do. It takes a lot of your practice time, but there are ways around that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Of course, educate your coaches, your athletes, the parents on the signs and symptoms and how to prevent heat stroke, well-balanced diet, adequate sleep, Believe it or not, inadequate sleep is one of the biggest risk factors for heat stroke sometimes. All right, when you talk about acclimatization, all right, it's a process where your body naturally protects itself from the heat. Most of us if, uh, down south are much more acclimated to the heat than people up north, even if you just walk into your car in the parking lot after work. Okay? And if you do any yard work, whether it's at 5 in the morning or 9 at night, like I do, um, but you get some acclimatization. Your body becomes efficient to tolerate the heat. All kind of physiological changes take place. You increase your blood volume, so you have more blood and more fluid in your, in your body system than anybody else. Your, your, your sweat mechanism becomes a lot more efficient. You put out more water and keep in more electrolytes. Um, and then it usually takes about 60 to 90 minutes of exposure to heat today a day for about 10 to 14 days to accomplish this. Now, the Alabama High School Athletic Association rules on acclimatization, while they fall a little bit short of the national goal, if you will, that we're going to see later on, thanks to uh, Coach Savarese and his insight and the medical advisory committee that you all met earlier, we've made some changes that I think are going to help. Now, I've, I've already had some disgruntled coaches a little bit about this, but again, I don't think the changes that we made are, are that serious, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Obviously, the first fo day of fall football practice is Monday, August 6th. Am I right? I always worry that I'm getting the wrong dates, but I, I checked on that. <laughs> and the first three days of practice have to be just in shorts by themselves in helmets, okay? This is hopefully to get these kids used to working a little bit in the heat. And the first day of full practice, full pad practice, is going to be August 9th, okay? If an athlete is on vacation and can't make it there the first day, for whatever reason, he's got to have those three days without full pads on before he can practice, okay? During two-a-day practices, only uh, one practice day can be in full pads, all right? Again, that's just to prevent the heat-work-rest ratio from being overloaded, you got to give them a chance to, to slow it down. Now, this year, this year we added two things. One is we don't want two consecutive days of two-a-day practices. Okay, so you don't want to have two, three days in a row of two-a-day practices. I've been doing this for about 25 years. I've got coaches that have three-a-day practices almost every day in some places. And, and I realize I understand 
the old school, the new school, whatever school you went to, mentality of, well, I got to get these kids. Some of them have not played before. I'm getting freshmen up. I'm getting kids that have not done it. And the more we practice, the, the better we're going to be. But if you have athletes that can't function because they're overworked and overheated and too tired, you're not getting anything out of them anyway. Okay? The other thing is, and to me this is very important, is that there's a four-hour break between your two-a-day practices. That gives, hopefully, adequate time for your athletes to rehydrate themselves and cool down before they go back out. Now, we're not basically limiting when you can go out, when you can't go out, and how long your practice is, and these kind of things, which are some of the things that they're doing nationally. But give them that break, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that. This is, anybody familiar with Corey Stringer? Anybody remember Corey Stringer? Played for the Minnesota Vikings. He died of heat stroke a couple years ago at the age of 27. There's been an institute set up in his name by his wife at the University of Connecticut run by a gentleman by the name of Doug Costa, who is one of the leading experts in heat illness in this country, that has come up with a bunch of different guidelines on how to prevent heat stroke and how to treat. If anybody wants to know this and want to get information, if you want to learn anything about heat stroke or heat illness, I would go to the CoreyStringerInstitute.com and you, you, everything from buying a, one of those tubs to buying a rectal temperature probe or whatever you want to do, but all the education there is on there. This is a chart that just basically goes what the NCAA's requirements for, for heat acclimatization versus what they think is adequate for high schools. A little bit different on different things on what equipment can be used, how often they can have single practice days and these kind of things. There's a movement in this country, and I know we've, you've, we've done all the things on concussion, we changed, we made a state law and all these kind of things. I think the next biggest health preventive medicine thing for athletes is going to be this heat stroke to try to prevent this because we can practice just as hard and, and, and just as long in the heat if we take some of these simple precautions. Now, one of the things, either of the guidelines they have is basically that on days one through five, you could only have one practice a day. You could have a walkthrough, okay, at some other point in time. Um, as long as there's at least three hours. Now, they only recommend three hours. State of Alabama recommends four, which I'm happy with, okay? Um, the first couple of days, helmets only. We have three days. They're saying only the first two days. The other days, they can have helmets and shoulder pads, but not to initiate full pads until day six, okay? That's workable, okay? I don't think, I mean, I know what y'all do, and, and, and we're getting, a lot of the coaches are getting smarter and smarter and realize that, Taking out some of the contact and lessening your injuries gives you a better team at the end of the year. Um, I work for a coach that firmly believes that, that you, can, that you don't have to go full speed hitting each other, beating up your own players, and still get the, the instruction, the education you need to, to, to make your system work. Okay? And, and we even see that, of course, we see at the NFL, they don't have as many players, but certainly at the high school level, you know, they don't have to be hitting each other banging each other up as, as long and as much. You could probably feel just as good of a team if you just went in shorts and shoulder pads all year long with just thud practices. But we all know that part of learning the game is to experience how to fall, how to tackle, how to get hit, how to be hit, and these kind of things. So you have to have this built in somehow. Okay. Um, how does Alabama fare compared to the rest of the country? The, the states in green are the states that meet all of the recommendations by this national organization. Okay? The states in blue don't meet it, but are working on it, and we're blue. Okay? So that's good. We're not sitting out there uh, off the wall like everybody blames the South on being way behind the times. We are not. We are way up there. Okay? We just don't meet all of their criteria. Okay? So first two days, again, shorts only, no consecutive double-day practices, four-hour rest period, uh, between practices and most important things that we want to do. All right. One of the things you can do is monitor your temperature of, your, of, your, of, of the day and then adjust your practice schedule depending on how hot it is. Now, we all have schedules, and we all have to keep schedules, and we all have personal lives where we have to get out and do some things, but sometimes adjusting a practice either an hour earlier or an hour later can make a big difference on, on preventing heat illness. There's a lot of different ways to do that. You can, you, can, you can have, if you have an athletic trainer, they can sometimes get these devices to measure temperature and the humidity, something called a wet bulb globe thermometer. Um, if you, there's a website. If you, anybody's got a smartphone, 
If you plug this in, it's by the Oregon State Athletic Association. All you do is put in your zip code, and it'll tell you what the wet ball globe temperature is for you right there then. Now, that's the temperature that tells us both, it measures both the ambient temperature outside and the humidity. And we know that that's where our risk factors are, okay? We want to practice usually earlier in the morning and later at night. This is a wet ball glow thermometer. This is what one looks like. It's a little portable unit, costs about $150. Uh, we can't pay our coaches $150 to coach, so I know nobody's going to buy these. Hopefully, people like me, excuse me, uh, will prov provide these for your schools. Now, there's some guidelines that were put out by the American College of Sports Medicine years ago on measuring these temperatures and then saying, okay, if the temperature's this, you shouldn't practice, okay? This was set up for races, for marathon races and these kind of things. Georgia, I don't ever like to say anything good about Georgia, but Georgia came up with some ones that are a little bit more reasonable for the South, okay? Basically, it raises the temperature up a little bit, and you can look at this. This is on the Corey Stringer Institute. Now, one of the things that you remember is that these guidelines were, were mostly for athletes in shorts and shirts. You have to adjust for equipment. If you went by those strict guidelines that originally came out, we'd never practice down here, okay? If you look at the wet bulb go temperature, and if you look at that middle line, that zone three, at six o'clock in the morning, the number's too high. At noon, the numbers are even higher, move, shifting your curve over to the right, and at 6 o'clock at night, they're still above that. When these recommendations first came out, I had one of these things at the university. I'd go out there every day, and I had, I had a trainer myself for two-day practice. We went through the whole camp when we had the old way we used to do the summer camps. There was one day in that first two weeks that I could have practiced following those guidelines, and that was 7 o'clock in the morning after it just finished raining. No other day. I was violating the policy if I practiced any other time. So I realize it's difficult, but there are some guidelines. And it's just something to, to know. They're basically, if, you're, if it's real hot and real humid, push the practice back an hour, take off some of the equipment, something. Okay? One of the things that I think is real important for athletes is to weigh your athletes before and after practice. Okay? We know that a pint's a pound the world around. So if an athlete loses five pounds in a practice, he needs to fill up with five pints of fluid. I don't care what fluid it is as long as it's legal. Get it in a system to rehydrate them, okay? So we try to replace that, that fluid loss during activity. One of the easy ways to do this is to ask them to look at their urine co color. Again, I'm telling you all to do things that we traditionally don't talk about, looking at urine, doing rectal temperatures. I realize that. But there are some charts that are available, and we have them at the University of Alabama, and at my high schools that I take care of, posted right over the urinals. It gives a, it's a color chart showing that if your urine's this color, go see your coach. If it's this color, you need to drink more water. If it's this color, you're okay. Real simple things, put above your urinals, let the kids know about. My basic rule of thumb is that I tell kids when they leave practice, if it's a morning practice, I say I want your urine either clear or the color of light lemonade before you come back. However you want to do it. If your dad's a doctor and he's going to give you an IV at home, fine. But, but, but whatever you do, get your urine that color. And that's the color your urine should be at bedtime before you go to bed. That's a simple thing to tell your kids. If they're doing that, they're going to be hydrated. Okay? And that, that, that hydration is one of the most pre best preventive things. Have ice bags available. Okay? Adequate cold fluids available at your breaks. Okay? One of the things that I see very often is that sometimes the brakes are taken out in the middle of the field with, with water caddies or a hose or, or some, some of these things. Some of the kids don't ever get the water because they're waiting in line. There's a long line. There's only a couple of fountains or whatever. My recommendation is to have a cool zone. When you're going to take a break, have a place where these kids can get out of the sun. Whether it's just in the shade, have a tent, whatever. I encourage them to take off their uniform, at least their shirt and shoulder pads. They're going to evaporate tremendously, even in just a 10-minute break. They're going to evaporate tremendously without those pads on and can cool that core temperature as fast as it went up. So have a cool zone. Have plenty of water available for them. It might be where you have your cool tub in case you have an issue or whatever, but just some way for them to get out of the heat uh, during their rest period. Make sure that their, their fluids are cool. Does it have to be Gatorade, Powerade, or any of these other things? No. Water's your best thing. Cold water is best because it's absorbed faster. You put in some salt in it, okay, it prevents heat cramps. You put a little sugar in it, 
and it allows them to maintain that energy level in a period of, if they're exercising up to like three hours. But it waters fine, okay? So you don't have to go through a lot of expense other than your water bill. The NATA came out with a, a um, policy on, on fluid re, uh, replacement. Very simple. You want to make sure that they're hydrated before they go to practice. So we tell them to drink up to 20 ounces within a couple hours before they practice. Take a couple of breaks every 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, depending on the time of day you're doing it. Drink a cup of water, eight ounce cup of water at, at each one of those things. Okay? Um, and then afterwards, really rehydrate them afterwards. And again, the urine chart is, is I think, very important. Fluid should be cool. Again, if they have carbohydrate, that, that, that helps them with lengthy exercise. It, and it may help them recover for the next practice or next day also. But again, I'm not advocating using those things because they are expensive. Um, I do like using electrolytes. If you don't have electrolytes, any of the foods that are high in salt, salt tablets you can buy, uh, various different places. We usually have a rule of thumb that for every pound of weight they lose, we want to replace it with a gram of sodium. And we, we kind of max that out at six grams, okay? So they take in an extra six grams of sodium a day. That's, that's a lot of these salt tablets. It takes three salt tablets to make a gram on most of the commercial type of salt tablets. So when you have having to replace six, that's 18 of those pills they're trying to swallow, and they're not really easy. But you can space it out, take one at a time. It doesn't really matter. And the most important thing is not right then. It's going to be for the rest of the day, that night, or something like that to get their salt back in. Avoid caffeine. Okay, caffeine, carbonated drinks, energy drinks, these kind of things are not good. They're, gonna, they're, they're bad for a lot of reasons, but they will, they will certainly increase their risk for heart disease, I mean, uh, for heat stroke. And we see this all the time in, 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 in half times of games or even on breaks. Some schools, kids like Cokes. They taste great and stuff like that. But the carbonation and the high sugar content in and the caffeine can cause some problems. If you don't have any other way to cool it, they had fans, simply some box fans or something like that in your cool zone to cool them down. Uh, some of these fancy ones you can get these now where you can buy, it has a little mister in it that cools, it, that cools them down also. Um, just remember, though, that a wet athlete is not a good athlete. He's not, he's not evaporating if he's soaking wet. Okay, that's why I like them to take off their, their pads and everything and dry off because that's going to be the best way. Uh, air conditions, okay, so move them into your locker room or, or if your field house is air conditioned, that's a good way. You've seen some of these cold benches that they're selling nowadays to, to have your athletes sit on them. If you've got that kind of money, that must be nice, but they are a waste of time. You're not going to be able to cool your athletes down well enough with, with anything like that. This is a, a, a chart that looks at, at what's the fastest way to cool your athletes down. Okay? Way over here on the edge, these two over here on, the, on, the far, on your far right are the ice tubs. Okay, and, or just severe cold water. The next one down is ice towels. Somewhere there in the middle, there's helicopter downdraft. Anybody use helicopters to cool off your athletes? Believe it or not, there's been a study about that, okay? But it sits about in the middle of the pack. The thing that works the least is the way that we were all trained. Put an ice bag in, in all their points where their major arteries are, under their axilla and their groin at their neck. That won't do it. Don't even go there. You're wasting your time. Take that ice and dump them on with some wet towels and you can do a lot better. Okay? A little bit of word about rectal temperatures. They're the only way to truly know the core temperature. Um, it shouldn't be substitute for anything else. Oral temperatures, ear temperatures, forehead temperatures, under the big toe temperature, wherever you want to take your temperature, they're so inaccurate it's not even worth it. Okay? Um, it can be uh, done without much exposure by properly trained athlete, uh, uh, individuals, and hopefully that's going to be athletic trainers, your team physician, or, or paramedics, somebody. Um, if you can't do that, if your school doesn't have that or anything like that, assume that they're having heat stroke and cool them off. Assume that their temperature is greater than 104 degrees, okay, and you'll do all right. It is a medical emergency, so we have to take that in mind. And you should have a policy at the beginning of the year on, on the fact that that might happen so that the parents know that that's something that your athletic trainer may do or something like that. All right, a lot of different thermometers. The one on your right is the one that we used. I don't know why anybody would buy a giant thermometer that's either rectal or oral, but obviously they're out there, okay? This is how we cool our athletes right there, both at the high school level and the, and the college, at the university level that I take care of, 
okay? This is how I did it at the triathlon. We had a big tub that we laid them on and poured cold water off on them while we gave them IV fluids, okay? Anybody have any questions? Be happy to answer uh, questions from anybody on this. Yes, sir. The urine color charts, okay. Uh, there is a website that has it. Um, I made ours. <laughs> I know what colors I want. But on the CoreyStringerInstitute.com, again, I, I keep referring to that because if you want to do any kind of preventive medicine or preventive for your athletes, that's the website that's going to give you everything. It's got links to anything you can think of that I've just talked about. But it has a link to a color chart that all you have to do is print out and then you can laminate it and hang it over. Uh, your urinals or in your field house or given to them in their packet at the booster club meeting or whatever. Okay, anybody else? We do have several members of the medical advisory committee. I don't know if anybody has any questions that we'll be will more than happy to answer on any kind of medical condition uh, or, or policy that the state has. Uh, now's your chance to abuse me. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right, I what happens if they drink too much? All right. There is a certain there are certain situations where athletes can drink too much water. Okay. It, it doesn't usually happen in normal sports-related activities. It's usually in in ultra endurance type ath athletic activities like marathons or ultra marathons, where an athlete will drink water every 20 minutes but he does it for five hours, okay, or six hours. They can actually lower their sodium rate and their, their sodium level in their body and can end up having seizures and some other things. Um, and we do see that occasionally with some of these marathons that we cover and everything like that. But in, an athlete practicing at any practice that I've seen is not going to be able to drink enough water to drink too much. All right. Cool. Yes, sir. The question is the window of food before or after practice. For nutrition, most of the time you have want to have a, a good balanced meal about three hours before your practice. Now, that's not going to be able to do that at 7 o'clock in the morning. I realize that. But in, in between practices, they should be able to do that. But, but you're going to practice. If you have it any sooner than that, a full meal, you're going to have the stomach bloating and nausea and just not feel good. Immediately after the practice, to me, is the best time to get these kids some nutrition. And one of the best things to do is give them some sort of carbohydrate within the first 15 minutes after a practice. You're going to ensure that their body is getting the energy, the fuel it needs, for that next practice. That's one of the tricks we do um, in, in teams that we take care of there at tournaments where they have to play back-to-back -back games, whether it's baseball, basketball, these kind of things, is we make sure they get plenty of carbohydrates within the first 15 minutes. There's commercial available drinks, there's things like the old Gator Load and some of these things that have a lot more carbohydrate. I love gummy bears. Easiest thing to do for high school kids is pizzas, okay? You get a ton of carbohydrates after that, so if you've got matches where you're going to have every day, if you can hydrate or get them hydrated and get that carbohydrate within the first 15 minutes after their event, they're going to perform better the next day, I promise you. If you're trying to figure out what can they eat before they go out to a 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock practice in the morning, the most important thing is going to be have something in your stomach. Usually some of these things are a little easy to digest. Within the first 15 minutes after a practice, you're going to ensure that their body is getting the energy, the fuel it needs for that next practice. That's one of the tricks we do um, in, in teams that we take care of there at tournaments where they have to play back-to-back -back games, whether it's baseball, basketball, these kind of things, is we make sure they get plenty of carbohydrates within the first 15 minutes. There's commercial available drinks, there's things like the old Gator Load and some of these things that have a lot more carbohydrate. I love gummy bears. Easiest thing to do for high school kids is pizzas, okay? You get a ton of carbohydrates after that, so if you've got matches where you're going to have every day, if you can hydrate or get them hydrated and get that carbohydrate within the first 15 minutes after their event, they're going to perform better the next day, I promise you. If you're trying to figure out what can they eat 
before they go out to a 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock practice in the morning, the most important thing is going to be have something in your stomach. Usually some of these things are a little easy to digest, whether it's a bagel, uh, some of these things that are delayed, they give carbohydrates, certainly plenty of fluids, nothing wrong with cereal. Uh, the problem is the milk um, can sometimes lower your stomach emptying, but if you use skim milk, it's, it's not as bad. Um, so that's that morning practice is a little bit harder, but hopefully they had a good meal the night before that should their energy stores to be there. It's going to be that meal in between practice that's going to be hard. Before the game. Okay. Pre-game meals. Pre-game meals. Whatever they want to eat, because they're going to play on, on Friday what they ate on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay? So if you're going to... If you say, want to that again. say that again, Dr. Robinson. They're going to play on Friday night on what they ate on Tuesday and Wednesday. The old carbohydrate loading that we do the week before on some of these events. You know, I, I'll never forget when I worked with the New Orleans Saints... We had a guy that ate six chili cheese dogs before a game. I couldn't do that and function anywhere, or at least I'd never leave the bathroom, I don't think. But this is, that's what he did. So we, what the most important thing is to get him something to eat. I've had athletes at the university that could not eat pregame meal. Best thing for those guys is, is something like Boost or Insure, a liquid diet. You give them a liquid diet that has plenty of carbohydrates in it and then fluids and stuff like that, and they'll do fine. So the pregame is what they really they want. If you force them to eat a steak and a potato, they're not, gonna, not, not all of them are going to feel good about that. They don't, they don't, not all of them digest that. So you kind of kind of give them a choice. Sometimes some of them like spaghetti, some grilled chicken, steak, potato is fine for the traditional stuff. But, you know, what you don't want to do is to give them a meal that's going to be hard to digest so that they're going to feel bloated and, and have, a, have a stomach full of fat when they're trying to play in three or four hours. We have three physicians on our medical advisory board. Dr. John Greco from Huntsville, Dr. Larry Lemack from Birmingham, and Dr. James Robinson from Tuscaloosa. We have three of the finest physicians in Alabama, but this physician right here goes to high school football games every Friday night. If I call him anytime, and I do call him anytime, anywhere, he returns my phone call or answers that phone to provide information about medical safety information relating to our student athletes. He also serves on the concussion task force for this state. He is a leader in medical safety for the state of Alabama in all perspectives, and he is the co-chair of our medical advisory board. And the best thing is I watched him while, while he was up here. He's a teacher. And he was up here teaching, and he prepares all this. And I'll tell you the very best, best thing. He does it for free. He serves our member schools. Let's thank Dr. Robinson so very much. And yes, sir. Hold on, I'm getting instructions. Yes. Three people in the audience that here that have already been introduced are also the top in our state. Certified athletic trainers are so very important. Dr. Robinson has a dream. We're never going to achieve anything unless we dream. His dream to have, is to have a certified athletic trainer on the sideline of every school in this state. Well, we have the three best. You know, I met Doc Anderson when I had the opportunity to coach an Alabama-Mississippi game years ago, and he is as fine a certified trainer as there is in the state. Next to him, Drew Ferguson, the best in Alabama, one of the best in Alabama. He and Doc, y'all are getting pretty old, both of you. We have so much knowledge in these two guys, and as it relates to athletic injuries, I know our doctors do a good job, but our certified trainers pro provide us that school perspective. And Marshall Smith, who we just added from the Dothan area, does a fabulous job and brings a wealth of knowledge. 
So I'd like all three of y'all to please stand one more time and let's thank them for their service to all of our schools. Thank y'all so very much.